Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Spotlight Talk presented by Historic Beverly. Today, we're going to be looking at four ancient Roman coins in the Historic Beverly collection. We're going to explore a brief history of the society that produced these coins, and then we'll take a closer look at the coins themselves. These four coins were found off of Dane Street here in Beverly by a John Doe in, in 1978. They were then sold to Pratt's Coin Shop in Georgetown before being purchased and donated to the Historic Beverly Collection in 1991. Now seen here is a map of the Roman Empire at its peak, which was at about 117 AD. It included the territory around the Mediterranean Sea, including parts of Europe, Northern Africa, and Western Asia, with the city of Rome as its capital. At its peak, it covered 1.7 million square miles. Since paper money was not used until the 13th century, Roman currency was coinage that consisted of gold, silver, bronze, and copper. Over the course of its history, Roman currency saw many changes in form, denomination, and composition. Because of the economic power and longevity of the Roman state, Roman currency was widely used throughout Eurasia and Northern Africa from 476 to 1453. It was used so widely and frequently that it served as a model for the currencies of the Muslim caliphates which were the political religious states of the Muslim community, as well as the European states during the Middle Ages and the modern era. Roman mints were spread widely across the empire. Looking at the map here, we see the location of three of the mints that produced the coins that we are gonna be taking a look at today. It makes sense that multiple mints were needed to produce coinage, given just how vast this empire was. Now the manufacture or minting of coins in the Roman culture significantly influenced the later development of coin minting in Europe. In fact, the origin of the word mint is credited to the manufacture of silver coin in Rome in 269 BC, near the temple of Juno Monita. A bust of her is seen here on the left. She was a goddess who became the personification of money and her name was applied both to the money as well as its place of manufacture. And although the temple dedicated to Juno no longer stands, the image on the right shows what historians believe the temple may have looked like. Located at the center of the city of Rome, it was next to the place where Roman coins were first minted and probably stored the metal and coins involved in this process thereby initiating the ancient practice of associating mints with temples. The imagery of Roman currency transitioned during the reign of Julius Caesar during 49 to 44 BC. Seen here is a bust of Caesar that is considered the most accurate portrayal of his likeness. Before, coins often featured the images of various gods and goddesses or deceased rulers but Caesar ordered the minting of coins that bore his portrait, marking the first time coin was issued with the portrait of a living individual. This tradition continued following his death. Coins often attempted to make the emperors appear godlike by associating the emperor with divine attributes or emphasizing the relationship between the emperor and a deity. Featuring the portrait of an individual on a coin caused the coin to be viewed as fully embodying the attributes of the individual portrayed. To demonstrate the importance of imagery on a coin, a philosopher is said to have jokingly remarked, whose image does the coin carry? Trajan's, give it to me. Nero's, throw it away. It is unacceptable, it is rotten. Although of course he did not seriously expect people to get rid of their coins, this quotation demonstrates that the Romans attached a moral value to the images on the coins. Unlike the obverse, which the obverse is the front facing side of the coin, which during the imperial period of 27 BC to 476 AD 
almost always featured a portrait, the reverse of the coin was far more varied in their depictions. During the earlier period of late Republic, which was roughly 509 to 27 BC, there were often political messages to the imagery, especially during periods of civil war. However, by the middle of the empire, and although there were some types that made important statements and some that were overtly political or propagandist in, in nature, the majority of the images were stock images of personifications or deities. Roman mints were often used for propaganda purposes. These widespread population often learned of new Roman emperor when new coins displaying the new emperor's portraits were minted and circulated. It was so important that even emperors who only ruled for a short time made sure that one of the first things they did was issuing a coin that bore their image. So with that, let's take a look at the coins in our collection. I quickly want to point out that these coins are very small. Seen here is one of the coins compared with a modern day quarter and dime. We will be looking at close up shots of the coins, but I like to point out the incredibly small size so that you can fully appreciate the rich detail of these coins. Now seen here is a bronze Roman coin. On the obverse, which is the side we're looking at, we see a bust of the Roman emperor Constantius II. He is facing to the right and wearing coras, which is a piece of metal armor that soldiers wear to cover their torso and back. On the reverse side are two legionnaire soldiers holding spears and shields facing each other. Between them are two standards and below the soldiers is the mint mark and this coin was minted in Antioch. Constantius II was Roman Emperor from 337 to 361 AD. He was born in 317 as the third son of Constantine the Great. At 19, wars broke out between the Roman Empire and Persia. Constantius was given command of the army on the eastern frontier of the empire by his father. Despite initial minor setbacks, he ultimately killed the Persian general Narses and captured the city of Amida, which he refortified and built a new stronghold, which he renamed as Antonopolis. In early 337, his father died. Soon after his father's death, Constantius supposedly ordered a massacre of his relatives, though records about this are unclear. Some records indicate that he merely sanctioned the act rather than ordering it specifically. The massacre left Constantius, his two brothers, and three cousins as the only surviving male heirs of Constantine the Great. Constantius and his brothers proceeded to divide the empire with Constantius receiving the Eastern provinces, which consisted of Constantinople, Thrace, Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt, and Cyrenaica. Now seen here is the reverse side of the image. Following the deaths of his brothers, the Roman civil war of 350 to 353 broke out. Constantius went to war against a usurper, Magnentius. The war between the two raged on for three years before Magnentius committed suicide leaving Constantius as the sole ruler of the empire. His reign saw constant warfare and the borders were threatened by the Germanic people as well as by the Sasanian empire. Internally, the Roman empire went through repeated civil wars and usurpations, partially spurred on by Constantius's restrictive religious policies. He died of a fever on November 3rd, 361, at age 44. And according to historians, the legacy of Constantius is difficult to ascertain. Some say he was a conscientious empire, emperor, but a vain and stupid man, an easy prey for flatterers. Others have argued that his legacy has suffered at the hands of unsympathetic civil and ecclesiastical authors. Others argue that he simply was a murderous tyrant and an inept ruler. 
moving on to our second coin, we see this Roman coin, which is also made of bronze. And looking here at the obverse is Roman Emperor Valentinian I. He is facing to the right and is also wearing a cuirass as well as a pearl diadem on his head. The reverse shows the emperor walking to the right and holding a military standard. He is dragging a captive with his left hand, and this coin also bears a mint mark, which tells us the coin was minted in Lyon, France. He was born in 321 and was the son of a prominent military commander. He grew up on his family's estate where he was well-educated in a variety of subjects and arts. In the late 330s, he joined the army and was assigned the position of Protector Domesticus, a guard unit assigned to protect the Roman emperor. In 355, under Emperor Constantius II, Valentinian was accused of failing to notify the Roman troops of raiders who had slipped past his watch post and inflicted heavy losses. Valentinian was removed from the army and was likely exiled. With his army career in ruins, he returned to his family's estate. But following the deaths of both emperors Constantius and Julian, Valentinian returned to favor under Emperor Jovian. Jovian's rule was short, as he was either assassinated or accidentally poisoned only eight months into his reign. Following Jovian's death, the Roman army marched to Nicaea for a meeting of civil and military officials to choose a new emperor. The assembly was able to agree on Valentinian as he was both qualified and accessible. Seen here is the reverse side of the coin. As we can see, there's the emperor um, holding a military standard as well as dragging a captive behind him. Now Valentinian accepted the offer of emperor and became emperor on February 26, 364. His reign was immediately threatened when a portion of the army threatened to riot, but Valentinian was able to assuage their fears by assuring them that the Roman army was his greatest priority. He also announced his intention to select a co-emperor to rule with him to prevent any succession crisis like those that had plagued the Roman Empire in recent years. He selected his brother, Valens. Like his predecessors, the Roman Empire saw several military campaigns throughout his reign. In the midst of these campaigns, Valentinian died on November 17, 375, after a blood vessel burst in his skull. Valentinian has a fairly popular reputation he was an able soldier and administrator and took an interest in the welfare of the humbler classes from which his family had risen. He founded schools, provided medical care for the poor, and permitted liberal religious freedom to his subjects with only ritual sacrifices and the practice of magic being outright banned. Despite this, he was known for his cruelty in his private affairs and often had servants and attendants executed on trifling charges. Due to the successful nature of his reign and the rapid decline of the empire after his death, he is often considered to be the last great Western Roman emperor. The third coin here in our collection is again made of bronze and shows the emperor Valens, who we just mentioned, who was Valentinian's brother. Now the obverse of the coin shows a bust of Valens. He's wearing a um, diadem and is again wearing a cuirass. The reverse shows Valens facing to the right, holding a military standard in his right hand and a bound captive in his left hand. This coin also bears a mint mark, indicating that the coin was minted in Siscia. And this image, the reverse image, is very similar to the image on the Valentinian coin, and we can see it is a little bit clearer, we can see a little bit more detail on this coin. Now Valens served as Eastern Roman Emperor from 364 to 378. 
He was given the eastern half of the empire by his brother Valentinian after his accession to the throne. Born in 328, Valen spent much of his childhood and early life on his family's estates in both Africa and Britain. Much unlike his brother, Valens had no experience in civil or military affairs prior to his selection as emperor by his brother. Valens was given control of the eastern half of the empire, which included Greece, the Balkans, Egypt, Anatolia, and as far east as the border of the Persian Empire. Upon arrival in the eastern portion of the empire, Valens was immediately met with news of the revolt of Procopius. Procopius was a usurper who had proclaimed himself emperor in Constantinople. Procopius quickly won favor and support for his reign through a propaganda campaign. News of Procopius's success rattled Valens, and he considered both abdication and suicide. Eventually, with a steadied resolve, Valens began preparing to fight the revolt. Two battles between Valens and Procopius resulted in a rout of Procopius's forces, who was ultimately captured and ex executed. Valens' reign continued to be plagued by military conflict with the Goths and Sassanids, which resulted in a deteriorating state of affairs in the East. Following the death of his brother in 375, Valens' nephew, Gratian, had been elevated to the position of co-emperor alongside Valens. The shift in political leadership proved disastrous for Valens. The Gothic War, which broke out around the time of Valentinian's death, was creating pandemonium in the eastern portion of the empire. Gratian urged his uncle to wait until the troops from the western half of the empire arrived before attempting to fight the Goths. Valens, emboldened by some minor successes in battle against the Goths, ignored his nephew's advice and decided to advance at once and claim the victory as solely his own. At the Battle of Adrianople, Valens was defeated and killed in battle by the Visigoths. Along with Valens' death, the battle resulted in two-thirds of the Eastern Army's demise and incapacitated the Roman government. Valens' nephew and co-emperor, Gratian, was overcome by the debacle, and the catastrophe continued to spread out of control until the appointment of Theodosius as Roman emperor. The Battle of Adrianople marked the beginning of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. And seen here, we see a close view of the reverse side, again, showing that great detail that's found on that coin. And then this close-up on the right shows, um, although it is a little difficult to discern, that is the mint mark of the coin, which tells us where it was minted, which in this instance was um, in Physica. Now the final coin we're going to be taking a look at is once again bronze. And the obverse of this coin shows the bust of Roman Emperor Gratian. He is facing to the right and wearing a very obvious pearl diadem, as well as a cuirass. The reverse on the, of the coin shows victory facing left and holding a palm and a wreath. Unfortunately, there's no obvious mint mark on this coin, so we don't know where it's made. But as we can see, there is some damage to the bottom of the coin, so it's likely that it may have unfortunately just faded with time. Now, Gratian served as Roman Emperor from 367 to 383. He was married twice, and both marriages failed to produce any children. He was the son of Emperor Valentinian I and nephew of Emperor Valens, the subjects of the previous two coins. Upon the death of his father, Gratian became co-emperor with his uncle Valens. Gratian was allowed to remain in control of border provinces and was given command of troops in order to defend them. He led several military campaigns and successfully defended the borders of the Roman Empire for years. However, following the Battle of Adrianople, 
Gratian's troops became increasingly frustrated with him until, finally, one of his generals by the name of Magnus Maximus launched a revolt against Gratian. Gratian, deserted by his troops in Paris, fled to Lyon. There, the governor betrayed and captured Gratian. He was turned over to his rebelling troops and was assassinated by them on August 25th, 383, at the young age of 24. Gratian's reign is marked as an important moment in church history. It's during his reign that the Nicene, Christian, that Nicene Christianity became dominant throughout the Roman Empire. Nicene Christianity is a set of Christian doctrinal traditions which reflect the Nicene Creed. Now, we're not going to dive into this topic, but the main point to take away is that Nicene Christianity believes that Jesus is in fact a divine individual. During Gratian's reign, an edict was published that all Roman subjects should profess their belief in the Nicene faith. Gratian also took active steps against pagan worship. He began appropriating the income of the pagan priests as well as the Vestal Virgins, and he forbade the Roman people from giving their property to these pagan worshipers. He stripped pagan priests and Vestal Virgins of their privileges and immunities that they had enjoyed under previous administrations. And he also confiscated all pagan temples and shrines as well as their income revenue in the name of the royal treasury. Combined, all these acts put an end to the period of widespread religious tolerance that had existed in the Roman Empire since the death of former Emperor Julian. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we don't know how these coins ended up in Beverly before their discovery in 1978. Perhaps they came to Beverly during the Victorian era when there was a renewed interest in classical antiquity. Perhaps someone purchased them after they were inspired by a piece of Charles Lawrence's ancient reproduction property pottery. Perhaps they simply were purchased by someone with an avid interest in Roman history and coin collecting. But no matter how or why they ended up in Beverly, these coins serve as a reminder of Beverly's connections to both a larger world and its history. And with that, I want to thank you for attending this presentation by Historic Beverly. If you'd like to support future programming, please text to give by texting HISTBEV to 44321. You can also support us by becoming a Historic Beverly member at the link there at your screen. If you have any questions about anything you saw in today's presentation, I encourage you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, historicbeverly.net. And I encourage you to check out our Facebook page as well as our website for any upcoming programs that we have, as well as continue to check out our YouTube channel for additional digital content to be added. Thank you again so much for attending this presentation. We hope to see you very soon. Bye-bye.